Welcome to How Student Journalists Are Helping to Fill the Gap in Local News. I'm your moderator, Dara Warland. I lead creative strategy at the News Literacy Project. I'm also the host of the organization's podcast, Is That a Fact? And I was a journalist for about a decade before I joined NLP. And here's a fun fact. I started my journalism career as the editor of my high school newspaper, and then as a reporter for my college newspaper at the University of Toronto, where I'm from. So I'm really excited to dive into this conversation tonight. And I have the greatest respect for our panelists and the work that they're doing. Our theme for our fifth National News Literacy Week, which this panel is part of, is Spotlight on Local News. And we wanted to explore the crisis in local news coverage and efforts to keep it alive. And in the course of researching the topic, we kept reading a lot about the great reporting coming from students across the country in high school, colleges, in publications that are attached to colleges, those that are not independent publications and outlets. And then also how student reporting was actually filling this gap created by the shuttering of local news outlets. And so we became really intrigued and we wanted to do an event related to that. So we pulled together this panel of three young and emerging reporters who are doing what we consider exemplary work in this space to talk about the impact their work is having on their communities. So I wanna introduce them now. Uh, we have Sarah Maloney, who's the managing editor of the Eudora Times. She's a Pointer Coke Media and Journalism Fellow this year as well. And she graduated from the University of Kansas with a BS in journalism and a minor in sociology just last year. And during her time at KU, she was the co-editor-in-chief of the University Daily Kansan and a digital producer at KSNT TV. So welcome, Sarah. So excited to be here. Thanks for joining us. Ashlyn Myers is a journalism and creative writing student at Franklin College, a small liberal art university south of Indianapolis, where she's also the executive editor of her school's multimedia publication, The Franklin. And also, Ashlyn's also spent the past three years working as a reporter for the statehousefile.com, a not-for-profit news website powered by journalism students and housed right in the Indiana State House. And I don't know how you find time to do all that, Ashlyn. Welcome, and thank you for taking time out of what's obviously a very busy schedule to join us tonight. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited for the conversation. It's going to be amazing. Great, thank you. And then we have Harsidic Singh, who also goes by Sid, who's a high school senior who's part of the editorial team at the Arlington Amp, a youth-led hyperlocal news source. And he interned at the Indian Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, and he's lived in over six countries already at his young age, including Libya, Romania, and India. And he brings a global perspective to his local journalism. He plans to double major in journalism and political science in college with a view to pursuing a career in investigative reporting. So welcome, Sid. Thank you so much for introducing me. My pleasure. So I wanna start with kind of a general question for all three of you. I'll direct this first to Sid. How did you get into journalism and why is local journalism in particular important to you, especially someone so worldly as you said? Well, thank you for that compliment. But I think uh, I'll be very honest. Journalism was not a predestined path for me. I've always been a storyteller, but <clears throat> I've always viewed jour journalists as a, before I went into the profession as a bit elitist, because I thought that they would simply report facts and then they weren't concerned or they were not concerned with the ground reality of those events taking place, of those issues taking place. And, but then when I became a reporter for my school newspaper, when I wanted to learn more about my local community, which is very fractured right now, because what we've seen, as you mentioned before, is a local news is dying all over America, but also all over the world. Communities are getting torn apart. Polarization is increasing. Almost everywhere I have went, polarization has like, I've seen it increase. There we can't talk about important political issues because we fear what we're gonna learn about the other person, that we won't have a productive conversation, it'll just evolve into petty arguments and um, infighting and so much more. And when I stumbled upon local journalism, which is very human-centric, it's all about human connections, it's all about 
understanding your community. It's all about um, getting a stranger to tell a story about their life that actually bridges the entire, like all the people who reside in that area to that issue. It, what, what we do is we don't characterize, we humanize the issues and we talk about implementation in certain areas in, in Arlington, for example, rather than the, the national debate for the entire country. And that's why I think it's very important and I love doing it. And how did you get into it exactly, into journalism? Um, well, I was a reporter for my uh, high school newspaper. I interned and I just did it because I want to learn more. I think I uh, someone told me that's a great conduit to learn more about the world, to more about yourself, mm -hmm. to uh, learn more about your community. And that's why I went in. Even, even if there was a preconceived bias there, my worldview was changed because I realized how transformative it is. It binds an entire community together. Mm, great. All right. Thanks for that, Sid. So how about you, Sarah? The two-parter. Yeah. So I got involved first with journalism in high school. Um, I think my advisor is actually watching right now. Um, and mm -hmm. um, I joined or I took journalism as a class having done a lot um, of writing and knowing that I loved it, but I never really knew what avenue um, and I never really even had figured out what major I was planning for college. Um, and then I decided to join newspaper my senior year of high school. Um, thanks to a really passionate advisor. I just, it really, really stuck with me. Um, and that's when I decided to major in news and information at KU. Um, and honestly, that's that's where it all happened for me. Um, and then as far as why my um, job is important and why, you know, I love what I do, I think um, seeing the reward specifically in this rural community has been um, so special to me. And I think that not every everything could have provided me the reward that I've received um, in this specific community and just from a community um, journalism perspective. That's great. Thank you. And Ashlyn, how about you? So how did you get into journalism and, and why is local news in particular important to you? You know, both the answers kind of go together for me. My mm -hmm. first like real exposure to journalism was because I was a homeschool student. I did went, was through like this online but public school through our state um, in Indiana. And this journalist from my hometown paper had come because I worked with a bunch of other students at this like woman's house who just like helped kids like get through online school. So they had like somewhat of a teacher to hold them accountable at the beginning of their journey with online school. And so I was still around some kids, but it was kind of like homeschool. And this journalist had come to just learn what it was like to have a first day of school when you're just walking to your computer instead of going onto a school bus and, you know, the traditional thing you think of when you're a kid and you go to school. And I was talking to her about like what her day was going to be like later on. And she was like, oh, well, after this, I have to go to a hunter. Uh, it's called Hunter's Honey Farm. And it's really local to us. And it's like this owned 200 years in the same family, this bee farm. And I thought that was so weird how she was going from like talking to little kids to going to like be in a bee suit. And then after that, she was going to go to the courthouse. And I thought that was the weirdest, like coolest thing. And ever since then, I've been so like enamored with journalism in a way. And since then, of course, I've seen more like intense examples of how journalism can help. But that was the first time I was like, wow, like it's amazing to see how many places journalism can take you in one day and how if you wouldn't go, people wouldn't be able to see it at home. Yeah, I've got a big smile on my face because of those great opportunities you get to have to experience other people's lives like that. Um, so cool. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, what was the motivation behind starting the Eudora Times and how did you get involved with it? Yeah, so my boss, who was formerly my professor when I was at KU, um, she started the paper almost five years ago, exactly. Um, and Eudora had lost their newspaper during the recession. Mm. Um, and before that, they had a pretty stable newspaper. Everybody knew it. They all got print copies. And, it, you know, it was like your traditional hyper-local um, paper. 
um, after they lost it, my boss was kind of trying to brainstorm ways um, to get college students in the more community journalism realm, because that's just not something most universities can provide. Um, and she came up with the idea just to do some little things here and there with the city. Um, and eventually it took um, its full form as a digital publication. Um, and so ever since then, she's been running it with the help of students. Um, and that's when I got involved two years ago now. I was a junior in college um, and I was taking Eudora Times as a class. And um, I didn't really know at the time what, what I wanted to do still. Like I knew journalism and news was where I wanted to be, but I didn't know like what avenue that was gonna take me. And then, local news and community journalism really stuck with me. Um, and I just absolutely fell in love with, with what I do. Um, so then after I took it for a semester as a class, I was able to stick around. Um, and then I just got lucky enough to get my fellowship and be able to be full-time. Um, and I'm the first full-time journalist that the newsroom has had. So that's created some stability and also I've been able to help our younger reporters kind of navigate being a student and also writing for you know a city publication so so was the idea of creating the Eudora Times ultimately to create sort of a sustainable local publication for the for the area for Eudora yeah yeah, yeah her her plan I mean it took more of that role later on once she realized like this really can happen yeah. but yeah it's um it's the plan is to always have it there as a sustainable publication for the city it's a great model and another solution for the local you know for for filling this gap ultimately and like something that could be repeated in other areas where there yeah. are colleges and uh, where there are local papers that are shuttering. Um, it absolutely, it absolutely has been. And um, it's been so great to see other young journalists have that same drive for community journalism. Because I think just, you know, so many students just don't have the opportunity to get involved with it. And when they do, it sticks for so many of them. Um, so I, I think it's a great way to kind of give that opportunity to young people. Yeah, great mentorship opportunity. Um, cool. Okay. So Ashlyn, the state house file has a unique approach to bridging the gap where local statewide outlets weren't able to report as well. Can you talk about what you do and how it works and also just, you know, being located where it is? Yeah, absolutely. So Franklin College is blessed to have not one, but two publications. We've got the Franklin, which you mentioned earlier, I'm the executive editor of, and it's like you're stereotypical, very typical, like um, just college newspaper. We cover the town we're in plus the college. Um, and then the State House file is kind of a weird kind of extension. Uh, first of its kind of Indiana where our publisher, John Kroll, really wanted to give people that hands-on experience that Sarah was talking about. Um, but he wanted to do it in politics specifically because that's very, very hard for students to break into unless they're getting a job and going and doing it firsthand. So he decided to try and see if we could get an office in the press corps at the state house and basically sit right next to the likes of Indy Star and things like that. And so I think almost 20 years now, they got a office in the state house. So each January, they take a class of like anywhere from five to maybe 15 of the most students um, to spend their whole January just covering state politics because our session always begins in January. And then for the rest of the year, if a student is taking journalism as their degree, they have to spend a whole semester doing nothing but covering for the state house. So it really gives you that hands-on newsroom experience. And I've been blessed to do my January term three times now with them. I freelanced for them and then I've also done my semester last spring. So it's amazing to see how our coverage ends up then going to newspapers all across the state, especially ones who can't afford to have like a huge staff full of reporters. So then they have that that scene in the news in the state house, even if they are three hours south. And coming into the class, if you have an Im impression, how would you say the knowledge of local politics is for the students in general? Very mixed. Um, we have a lot of students from like poli side that come and try to get that mm -hmm. 
like new side of things, like how a reporter sees things versus just someone being a political advisor or working on a campaign. But I did not know like hardly anything other than just basic the stuff you learn in like government class in middle school. That's like all I knew going in. And you learn you learn on your feet like surprisingly fast when you're standing at a committee meeting and learning how a bill is made and listening to the song in your head all the time. Like it's <laughs> people can come from all backgrounds and I feel like you can grasp it very quickly as long as you're willing to learn. Okay, so for those who don't know what you're talking about, like for those maybe you know, logging on from Brazil, what do you mean by the song in your head? It's that I'm just a bill from what is it like schoolhouse rock or something? I don't mm -hmm. remember, but it's like explains like the process of how hard it is for a bill to make it without dying. And we always we always sing it in our little we call it the shack because they're very small newsrooms at the state house, but we always sing it in there when someone's like, Oh, like where, where does this bill go after second reading? And we're like, come on. But yeah, it's it's a really good time. So I guess the class offers an opportunity to learn more about local politics and to sort of get a lesson in civics in a way, as well as in reporting and journalism, you know, two things that are really important. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Um, um, so Sid, you worked on a podcast episode about restorative justice. How did you identify that as an issue that people should know more about? And how did you come to put that story together? Okay, well, I'm gonna, there, there are two reasons. So I'm just gonna, so they're, they're interconnected. Firstly, and, I'm someone. Oh. Just also, if you could maybe define restorative justice too, because I know course. the podcast episode was, uh, that was a part of the episode. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. Yeah. Restorative justice is an alternative to retributive justice and focuses on repairing the harm uh, with the community, with the person harmed, rather than punishing the perpetrator or punishing the person who committed um, an action or committed a crime. It's it's something that I've, because I've, I've seen people who have had one action in when they were young impact the rest of their lives. It, you commit one action as a teen and somehow it changes your entire trajectory of your life. It impacts your future, it impacts your um, jobs, it impacts your relationships. Uh, it impacts your relations within the community and outside of it too, you're always branded as a criminal. And and I think what really brought it brought in, in, into light for me was the fact that we're seeing a tough on crime rhetoric um, creep back into the national discourse. I'm someone who's really politically engaged and I saw how much of an issue crime was in, 2020, in the 2022 midterms and how we were seeing a return to that era. But on a more personal note, um, in my high school, there was a person who sadly passed away due to hit, hitting them. And mm. people in my school were clamoring to get the person, not just arrested, but like uh, for them, for him to face a harsh, harsh punishment. And they didn't really understand the idea of retributive justice. It could exist. They didn't understand how it was implemented. They only regurgitated opinions that I've heard on national news or what their friends told them or what was on social media. But there are so many nonprofits currently in Arlington which are trying to implement this program with the help of the government and without it as well. And I and I'm so thankful that I got an opportunity to talk with one of the CEOs of, of the organization who's leading this, the Banjo Patel. And that's just how it came to be because I reached out to so many of them. But I think that there's a certain story, there is a certain uniqueness in what uh, Ms. Patel was doing, whether it was the fact that they're going to create this youth court or how here, that's what it's called, um, works their restorative justice program. And I'll be honest, it was a very collaborative effort. I don't think I could have done it without my um, amazing supervisor, Ms. Kristen, who was there with every step of the, uh, every step of the um, journey, whether it was reaching out to all of these people, uh, replying to, not even replying to them, but uh, for follow-ups, if there are certain questions that haven't been answered or trying to nail down the specifics. Uh, and especially my fellow peers or the people who I was in my cohort with, like my reporters, they were instrumental with their group edits and na really narrowing down what this story is about, what this story aims to be. And I don't think I could have done it without them or Ms. Kristen, so a huge shout out to them. Thank you for sharing that. Um, my next question has to do with the impact that some of the stories that you've reported on have had on your local communities and 
Sid, it might be the story that you just shared, um, or it might be another one. Um, so if it's if it's related to the story you just shared, feel free to share about that. Um, I'll start with you then. Uh, sure. I think that there has been um, like a metamorphosis if we're if we're being technical. Um, because I talk with my friends and of course they get their news from what most people think Gen Z gets their news from, from social media, like TikTok and Twitter or now X and like Instagram. But I think because of my prodding and just a little larger community conversation we're having, there has been a shift towards um, local journalism because that's how you know what's going on in the community. And Arlington is very thankful to, or very grateful to have two, um, mm local newspapers or local media outlets but I feel like what differentiates the Arlington app and why so many people have decided to listen to it why it's created an impact because it's it's not just hyper local it's youth led the youth are stakeholders in all the issues that are going to impact like they're impacting the nation they're impacting the community whether it's affordable housing um gender identity the climate crisis and restorative justice and it's it's sparked those conversations when I have um, or when I converse with people about such topics, they seem less inclined to just shut the door behind them. They, they, they're they opening up their minds, they're opening up doors for um, not just policy, but for us to actually come together in a more unified community where we can discuss stuff without, as I mentioned before, without just, um, without being very single-minded in what we do or in what we pursue. That's great. Thank you. I love the student led angle too. And I think, you know, we need more of that. We need to see more of that. And I think that's something that uh, people, adults especially, want to encourage. Um, so, Sarah, how about you? What do you have an example of a story or stories that you've done that you've seen have a direct impact on the community that you serve? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I feel like every story we write <laughs> because it's like they're really because they're local stories. Else. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and there, there's no other way for this community to really like, you know, hear all this news um, from within, um, other than like Facebook groups, and those are not always great. So, um, but to answer your question. Um, I have covered everything from like school board meetings to city commission meetings to the hiring of um, new city manager. Um, and right now the city um, is kind of preparing for a potentially large influx of growth. Um, the city that I cover is 6,500 people right now, but five miles away, um, a Panasonic battery factory is being built. Um, and although it's not directly in Eudora's um, city limits, it's going to affect Eudora just as much as the city it's going into. Um, and that city also doesn't have a newspaper. Um, so all of the information I provided um, about what to expect, even, even though there's still so many unknowns, um, I got a tour of that factory and I've just been able to give people, you know, more information about what's what's coming and what the city is doing. Um, to plan for new growth, um, things like the environmental factors that are playing into a huge battery factory being close to their homes, um, and then tax concerns, um, utility infrastructure, higher utility rates. There's just things that, you know, people have been wondering, and those are all things that I can look into for them. What I think is so interesting about that example, Sarah, is it's sort of like the 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 typical story of a small town and industry kind of turned on its head because often you would hear about industry leaving a small town and the impact that that would have mm -hmm. um, on that small town. And this is the impact of industry coming into a town. Um, yeah. And, you know, yeah, like you say, all the different factors that that can have, um, all, the, all the different impacts that that can have. It's really interesting. Um, and how about you, Ashlyn? You know, there's been so many cool examples um, as a student journalist of like things taking their form over time, kind of like Sid mentions, it's like a metamorphosis. Like you see things change over time. And it's, I feel like that's the best way to gauge like a change on a community. But 
one in particular last year, I was very, very nervous to start covering really like hot topic political issues, especially in Indiana. We had a lot of, um, I would say like hot button culture war type bills going through both our Senate and our house. And it, they're nerve wracking to cover because there's so many people that have such like intense stories as to why they're important to them, why they're for or against a bill. And I was very nervous and I had to get a lot of pep talks from my editor of like, hey, this is a, this is why you're doing this. This is why it's important. Um, one ex example in particular, I'm sure most of you have heard of like the don't say gay bill from Florida. I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but um, basically it kind of outlawed any curriculum in schools regarding anything like whether it be sexual identity or just anything sexual, they didn't really outline things very well. But Indiana tried to do a bill the exact same way. And I talked to a ton of kids, whether it be um, kids identifying as transgender or parents that were concerned, or even just kids whose parents, they had two moms or two dads. And it was really interesting to hear people come from like all the way from Fort Wayne, which is like two and a half, three hours down to the state house, just to share their opinions. Um, and over time, after posting my first story, where I didn't think many people would see it, just because I feel like you always feel like that always a journalist, you're like, who's reading this? <laughs> um, and then like three months later, this bill is taking on a completely new form. And there's hundreds of people outside the state house walls that are protesting. And I had people saying that they had saw my work from three months ago. And it was mm. the weirdest feeling, like seeing that my work caused people, whether they're for or against, to come and share their opinions, because that's what really matters to me. And ever since then, I feel like it's changed my perspective on, yeah, it might be nerve wracking to run up and talk to somebody who's in tears or frustrated, but it it matters so much. No, that's great to see the impact that your work is having. So speaking of audience, what is your sense of young people and your peers in terms of how they're consuming news, whether or not they're consuming news, uh, you know, where they're getting it and their level of news literacy, um, which I, is probably a lot to unpack. Um, but just, you know, from your own lived experience of your your peers and granted, you know, your peers might be, a, you know, particular group because your peers might be more likely to be tuned into news if they're like you, but I'm just curious. Uh, and let's start with um, Sarah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people our age who are super news avoidant, mm. uh, but I also think there's a lot of people who are very, very informed. I think it's like not a lot of in between there, in my opinion. I think like people are either pretty informed and getting their news. Um, generally, it's really hard for me to speak on this because I feel like the people I surround myself with are all journalists. <laughs> so it's like, um, I don't really know where like your average, you know, 20 something gets their news because all the people around me are kind of like really in that realm but yeah I would say that there's really no in between there's like pretty informed and super news avoidant just because it's they just like don't want to know all the things going on and where are your friends getting their news Sarah so the ones who even the ones who are like an informed yeah. yeah yeah I would say like nonprofit newsrooms and um I don't know online like yeah, online totally, publications. Yeah. Totally yeah. online publications. I think a lot of people scroll through X still mm -hmm. um, and get news there, um, especially journalists. I think that's always been the case, though. Are they following news outlets? Is that how they're getting news? Or yeah, I'd yeah. say so. So yeah. consciously following, you know, reputable news sources? Totally. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah, I don't um, know. So you guys feel free to chime in on that because I don't know if you guys agree. Well, you know, that you're speaking for your circle. Um, how about you, Sid? Um, I think Sarah used the perfect word, news avoidant. Yeah, I'm I, curious I think, why news avoidant, though. What is your take on that, Sid? I, I think because it just, we're on, we're, especially with regards to social media, it feels like there's so much going on. There's so much always going on. We've become such a globalized world. We, that, that's what I want to mention. We, so many of us are news avoidant. I'm not, but a lot of my friends beyond like my journalistic circle are. And, but the thing is they still get exposed to news because of how much it's permeated the culture of our society. You might be just scrolling on X and reading a funny tweet 
or I don't know what they call it now, but a funny tweet, let's just say. And then you scroll mm -hmm. and then you see a horrific video of something just happening across the world. If it's, um, I don't know, a, a country going back into an authoritarian dictatorship and people are crying or people are protesting um, so loudly and then they're getting suppressed or people, uh, I don't know, or, or even more, much, much more graphic depictions of violence. And so it's really hard for you to disengage. And that's why people have started to run away from it a bit, especially mm -hmm. in national news. I've, I've turned on CNN, I've turned on like other um, news broadcasts because my dad likes them. And every 15 minutes, it's just breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. And it's mm -hmm. so hard to, I think for many people, they just get exhausted like to constantly keep caring about so many important issues which are affecting millions upon millions of people and they, they they decide ignorance is the answer but it's not it's local media it's about understanding what's happening in your community and fully engaging with it rather than um concerning with something across the world because that is something very pointed that you should advocate for that as well but it starts local change always starts local it doesn't start on a world level on a federal level it starts in your community and you create it Right. Yeah, it is hard to, no matter how avoidant you are of news, it, it's, it is hard to avoid information of some sort coming to you. It may not be coming from a reputable news source, but it's going to come to you in some form. Um, Ashlyn, how about you and, and your circle? Um, I definitely think whether like journalism minded or not, most of my friends definitely get their information from social media, just like Sid and Sarah have said, definitely X more than anything. I feel like it's just the easiest way to see some headlines really fast. And the big thing for me is I've been telling them like, hey, if you see a crazy headline before you start sharing it, how about you look at what's in the headline, what's underneath the headline, what, who they interviewed, if they interviewed one side. And so it's like, I've been slowly, I feel like I'm slowly like feeding them like little, like journalistic like ethics I'm like hey like did they interview both sides did mm. they talk to people of various ages like did they look at both sides of the thing did they take someone's quote the way it was or did they research like things like that but I think like both of them both of you guys have said so far it's just that people really don't want to like make themselves feel uncomfortable and then the other side of that is talking about news often leads to little like arguments especially nowadays like I feel mm. like you can't really have a civil conversation about politics, especially if you're not in your journalism circle. And um, I feel like we kind of like have a different way of like dissociating from it a bit because we read so many crazy things every single day. But I think people just like genuinely get scared to have a free conversation and just express their feelings without having like kind of inappropriate or angry discourse. And it's just something that we have to work on changing. And I think once we can stop having these clashings all the time is when people can start to support journalism more the way that it used to years and years ago. Mm. Everything is very charged. Um, I'm surprised to hear so much about X among your crowd. I would have thought I'd hear more about TikTok. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but maybe uh, maybe I'm just sort of, maybe that's just a, a cliche about, you know, your generation. Um, are you on TikTok and do you consume any news on TikTok or are you too news literate to be doing that or, or what gives? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I am on TikTok and I do use TikTok, but personally I don't even get, which is weird, but I don't get a lot of news co content on my for you page. Um, so personally, I don't consume news that way at all. I just mm -hmm. never have gotten that on my feed. Um, but also if I did, I, I don't know, it kind of, it kind of, I, like you said, there's a fine line, I think. Um, and it kind of just makes me cringe a little bit to be so honest with you. TikTok makes you cringe or just... I don't know. Maybe it's just, maybe I'm a little old fashioned for saying that. Like I'm, I'm honestly, I'm 23. So I don't know. You're so <laughs> but, skeptical. Are you skeptical? Yeah, Is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, and I, mean, I, think, I think that's fair. Yeah. I think the news, like news itself being on TikTok is what's cringe mm -hmm. to me a little bit. It's cringe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, you know, speaking of sort of like newer platforms and technologies. I'm curious what the conversation has been like among, you, you know, at, at your news organizations about AI. So, 
you know, we've talked to some reporters and news organizations about AI as an emergent tool for journalists. Um, are you using chatbots um, as a research tool? Uh, do, do your publications have any kind of policy around the use of AI? Um, you know, it's been talked about as potentially a great tool in the, you know, reporting process potentially, um, particularly for local news. Uh, any thoughts on this or have you not broached it yet? Um, but yeah, anyone who might have something to, to contribute on this front can speak up. I'll just say, because I'm, I'm really interested in computer science and AI is one of my um, passion, talk, like, I don't know, I'm really, really interested and really passionate about it. And our, um, the Arlington app does use uh, AI, not chatbots, but we use otter.ai, as I'm sure um, uh, uh, Sarah and Ashton might also, because it, cre it, it our Miss Kristen, our supervisor, tells us about the days before otter.ai and before you had to transcribe everything by hand. And it sounds so tedious. Mm. I, 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 it, it sounds <laughs> brutal. And I'm sure like a lot of us, a lot of people must just view that now as well. AI can revolutionize a lot of aspects of our job or right. of, of what we love. But as you know, we have to be very, it's a very thin line. We have to be very careful with how we, we use that because um, AI has been shown to perpetuate the biases that are that are in our system. Um, for example, Amazon in 2017 or 2018 had a, a hiring algorithm AI, which would screen applicants. And it was shown to systematically discriminate against um, women because of the black box or because of the data that was in it. And the same thing with facial surveillance. Uh, I, I was re reading this headline or um, I was reading an article the other day, which said that 38 percent of minority um, people are misidentified by a facial recognition technology, which is becoming, incre which is a tool increasingly used more and more. So you have to be careful when we bring AI into our world, we have to ensure that first we've put the right data, that we're using it for the right purpose. And yeah, I just think that we have to be very careful with that. Mm -hmm. And I, but I do think it can have radical change for the betterment. Mm -hmm. Transcribing used to be like the bread and butter of interns everywhere. Like that was what we did. <laughs> but I'm sure interns are not crying over not doing that anymore. Um, yeah, Ashlyn or Sarah, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I feel like the nice thing about AI is it does help a lot of our like brand new freshman students who have never done reporting a day in their lives, um, like especially with Otter. I feel like everyone these days loves it. And I do. Mm -hmm. I feel like the one thing that we have to be careful of is our editor whenever she talks about it, because she still prefers like an old fashioned recorder, like the actual handheld ones. She always talks about how people people tend when they first join the state house file to do Otter and then they'll just copy and paste and they won't like check it. So that's been the big thing that we've been trying to like explain to everybody is like, hey, this is a great tool. Most of the time it is correct, but sometimes if your recording is a little muffly, it'll change like wording and things like that. So that's been the big thing. I feel like that and like Grammarly, a lot of people use that as well, which does not help AP style. I don't know if you guys have, have had that experience, but I have to argue with it all the time over Oxford commas. But yeah, I, I feel like I use the basic little tools, but I haven't done anything like the chat boxes or anything. Okay, I have some questions coming in from our listeners and viewers. So I wanna share some of them and make sure they get a chance to weigh in here. Um, what advice would you share for small newspapers for incorporating students into their contributor roster? And is there a place for hybrid student town newspapers? Um, and maybe that's a good question for Sarah. What do you think? Can you ask that again? Please? Yeah, sure, sure. What advice would could you share for small newspapers for incorporating students into their contributor roster? So like bringing students in as contributors um, and is there a place for hybrid student town newspaper, uh, student, yeah. So I guess what they're talking about is having like a town newspaper that also incorporates students on the staff. Yeah, I I think that is a great idea. I think if you're talking um, about students who have like some somewhat of a journalism background or experience, um, I think that could prove incredibly useful. Um, I think 
you know, like it talks, I, I'm wondering like what age of student you're talking about. Um, but I, I think that that is a, I think that's a great idea. And I think that I mean, that's really no different than what we're doing in a way, because there's, you know, my boss who is a professor and also was a journalist, um, she kind of started it. So in the, in a way, it's the same thing, you know. Great. Um, okay, I am going to ask another question. This is coming in from Jane. How do we address the challenge of the business model and compensating students for their work? Well, that's a great question. That's a great follow-up from what we just asked. Uh, would we still need to rely on foundations or philanthropic funding? And also the assumption is that these are students who are already trained. Um, to make this equitable, it would be great to provide broader training and mentorship programs. And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit with, um, you know, kind of the training model that's built into, um, I think it's uh, built into the program at your school, right? Yeah. Do you want to address that? What about yeah. paying students? I mean, it sort of yeah. kind of almost brings up the college athlete kind of model, right? Mm -hmm. It's really hard. And it's really hard to not feel bad um, when you can't pay what you want to pay students. Um, cause I, I was there not that long ago and a part time I was working, you know, I was editor in chief of the Kansan and also doing Eudora times. Um, and it's like a full-time job. So I think the way that we've, um, managed to pay is, is through a lot of alumni donors. Um, and we've gotten funding that way. Um, and then, so the way that we're organized is we don't have a subscription fee, but we ask readers to donate regularly or put up, put in like a, you know, a reoccurring payment. So we do get funding that way and we're able to pay students that way, but it's not, I mean, it's not what it should be, I would say still, you know, cause we just can't afford to. Um, but that's also hard because, because of the community, I don't think yet a paywall would work. So it's it's a really also, it's a hard situation. Um, and unfortunately we just don't have the funds to, to pay more, but I think um, it is really important to at least pay your staff um, because they, they, if not, they're gonna have part-time jobs and then they're not gonna be able to dedicate the time um, that they should to what they're doing here. Yeah, it's tricky because, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, college athletes in uh, have fought to be paid is because it's a profitable uh, industry, you mm -hmm. know, whereas local journalism is not, which is one of the reasons why these yeah. publications have been shuttering. So, you know, it's it's a kind of a whole different ball ballgame, uh, forgive the pun. Um, so uh, I have another question here. Um, so um, actually, Ashlyn, you're going to graduate next year. Do you plan to pursue a career in journalism? I do. And a lot of the things that Sarah touched on are difficult. Um, thankfully, every journalism job I've had so far has one way or another been able to pay us. I mean, even at the State House file, we pay students for every single freelance story they do. Um, the, the funds are a little bit different depending on what kind of story. I think um, like briefs get paid a lot less than like a full, like full on source story. Um, but we get all of our funding from like different grants and things that we sign up for. But there are so many people that are looking into breaking, bringing news back to, especially those news deserts. So there's a ton of grants out there. You just have to look. Um, it's competitive, but we've been able to get most of that from there. But yeah, I want to go into journalism. I definitely, I don't think there's another place for me at all. It's, it's my favorite thing, but it's it's nerve wracking to see kind of where the industry is going and wondering how I can bring kind of fresh eyes to it to help. But yeah. Well, the industry will always need really great journalists. Um, here's a question directed to Sarah from Susan Watson. Uh, Sarah, are community members engaged with your e-edition paper? Um, and 
do you have a lot of local subscribers? You addressed this a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have participation from local advertisers buying ads in your e-edition? Yeah. So we've recently, so we are all online and we don't do like an e-edition. It's just all on our website. Um, and, but we do do a special print section. Um, we'll do like special projects, like, um, the lot, like last month we put out a new residence guide, which was like a magazine, something we've really never done like that before. Um, we've done like special edition sports, tabs we've done um we did the 50th anniversary of title nine we did a special print section for that and for our print stuff we have great um advertiser support from local businesses there is like a pretty substantial business community in eudora even though it is a really small town um and so that has been really successful um but it is harder to get people to pay for online ads because not only is our website kind of not the best but it's also people aren't getting, you know, they don't want to pay for a slot because they don't know how many clicks they're really getting. Um, and so it's hard to, it's hard to sell ads that way. And people also just, they, they want the physical, um, paper ads. Um, but we're not always doing a print issue. So, um, that's been hard. Um, and then on the other side, it's hard to know. So we send out a newsletter every week. Um, and we get a lot of people that way, but we don't have, that's really like our e-edition is our newsletter that we send out once a week. Um, and that has all of our stories from the last week. But I feel like half my job is really like spreading news literacy and making sure people understand um, that. And that was always a really important part of, of the class before I was actually, you know, like full-time um, was just learning about this community because people don't understand. So um that's been a really important part too. Well, why do you feel like half your job is spreading news literacy? Like, is that sort of in terms of like creating a demand for the product or well, like in very sort of crass terms, but like. Yeah, I think for me, it's just important that people understand our mission and, um, you know, they're not used to having a paper. And if they were, they never, a lot of people haven't met a journalist. They haven't talked to a journalist um, yeah. And they know journalism on this grand scale, and they don't really know what it's like to be a local reporter. And, you know, obviously there's a ton of mistrust, distrust mm. in the media, mm -hmm. um, especially in a small rural town. Um, so I feel like, you know, that's always been an important part of my job. But also on the other side of that, we've always received such a positive response. So, you know, it, it's a two-sided situation. So on the topic of news literacy, Kate H asks, have you, have any of you experienced any kind of news or media literacy education? So, you know, obviously if you're taking a journalism class or you've, you know, learned how to be journalists, there's that aspect, but then also about as a news consumer, did you ever receive any direct media or news literacy education? And if so, when was it like in elementary school, high school, college? Um, and then, you know, do you try to incorporate news education into your reporting? Sarah, you've addressed that part of the question, but did you yourself ever receive any news literacy education? I think definitely in college, a lot of my journalism classes touched on that. And then definitely when I took journalism in high school, um, I got a feel for that kind of stuff. Um, and then I just got super lucky with a professor who, you know, has extensive research in the journalism industry. And she's been able to have a huge impact on my knowledge of media literacy. Um, so yeah, I, I think for me, definitely in college the most, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Ashlyn, what about you? Did you sort of pick up news literacy in the course of your journalism training or did you ever, were you ever exposed to it in school? Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think I really got much of any news literacy education in high school or any sooner than that. Um, but I feel like the first day in college, my journalism professor was like, he gave his little spiel about journalism and how it'll be hard, but it'll be rewarding. And then the next thing he was like, and you better read up on the news. He's like, cause I'm going to ask you about it. And from then on, I have always got been in this like 
routine to check like what the headlines are each day just have a very very basic understanding of what's happening because I remember every class we would come in and we'd get a little pop quiz and it would be like who left the senate this week what happened here what happened here and it was a part of your grade and ever since then I feel like I slowly and everyone else in my class even if they eventually left journalism and weren't interested anymore they we still talk about how like important that was because it really got us trained to actually think about like outside of the classroom, like what's happening, even if it's not in Franklin, Indiana, like what's happening on a giant scale and also what's happening locally. Mm, yeah. I mean, I feel like learning how to be a journalist is the best news literacy education, you know, you can get. Um, and then Sid, what about you? Um, I, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna echo Ashley's point here. I don't think there was uh, an, a news literacy program in mm -hmm. elementary, middle, or high school. I think you have English teachers when you're writing a paper or you're writing an essay, and they tell you, of course, the basic guidelines that, oh, your the works that you cite should be verified, they should, you should check out uh, if they're, um, if they're unbiased, if they're reliable, mm -hmm. and that works, but I think people then tend to not use that education that they received minimum at uh, minimal at that in, in English and apply that to news because mm -hmm. it's so much easier just to see a headline or just to see something going on someone's story and just believe it rather than typing it in and then seeing as um as I think that was as I was mentioned that oh you're seeing who was interviewed seeing if every aspect was covered and that's not very it's not partisan it's just not um, showing one side of the story I think for some people they don't want to do that and it's just easier for them to just sift through and and feel like they've learned something or feel like they know about what's happening in world affairs when they don't that's simply a distorted version of what they know and i wish there there should be media literacy implemented in, in high schools especially because as i mentioned young people at, at gen z and um old people we they're we are essentially the generations are being most impacted we believe it we spread it we disseminate it we're we're the targets of fake news and misinformation. So yeah, I, I definitely think it should be implemented. Mm. Ashlyn, I have a question I'm gonna to direct to you. This is coming from Claire G and she wants to know, um, since you've reported on political issues, do you have a sense of how to get more young people uh, more involved in politics? I mean, from the journalism side of things, I feel like a lot of people hear the word politics and they kind of get scared. Um, and that's especially <laughs> how I was. I'm a huge like human interest. I love to sit down with somebody and talk to them for two hours, which you can't do with a politician. They wouldn't be happy with you. Um, but I definitely feel like you just have to get in there. You have to give them like one day to see what happens on a grand scale. And then they'll slowly, you'll see the gears turn a little bit. I know for me, I walked into the state house that first day and I was like, I don't want to do this. Like, this is going to be boring. I'm going to have to sit in these meetings forever. People are going to be rude. And while it's not always the most like flashy, engaging committee meeting, you learn and you see, especially with testimony and people coming to talk about from experts in the field on like, like last week I was in a meeting about lead pipes and I walked in like, honestly, mm -hmm. feeling like it was going to be really boring and like, I wasn't going to learn anything. And then there were all these experts talking about the effects that it can have on children mm -hmm. and the laws and guidelines as far as like buying a house that does have lead pipes. And I learned immediately how important it was, even though it sounds kind of funny and like kind of boring on its face. And I feel like that's all you need to do is just get somebody in that first step. And some people are just never going to be interested in politics. That's just how it is. But I feel like there's a lot of people that just need one step and then they'll realize how important it can be. Yeah. If you find that human interest angle, that's a great, that's a great piece of advice. Do you feel like the, your peers are interested in politics or, or your generation or um, that they're, you know, not interested? I will say, I feel like a lot of people my age are particularly interested, especially in the huge issues, like the issues that they can talk about at the lunch table, the issues that they can talk about what the president said or what's happening over here. We're in such a kind of crazy time politically. Um, so I feel like a lot of people are engaged in that way, but it's just kind of about like what we've said this whole this whole webinar about news literacy. Like it's just about bringing people to that next level and making them think deeper, especially even about local issues. I mean, 
the Eudora Times and the Arlington Amp, they're great examples of how to like show how local initiatives can change and make a big impact. So I think I think we have no issue with people talking about national issues, but we really just need to bring it back to the local piece. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Um, well, all politics are local, right? Um, we only have uh, three minutes left and um, just wanted to know if there's anything you think that we should cover before we wrap up. Um, anything that we didn't touch on that you think we should cover? I have one more question that I can put to you unless you think that there's something we should. I, we should, yeah. All right. I don't have anything specific. I just wanted to say um, if you have more questions about how this all works, how our newsroom specifically works, or want to know more, please email me. Um, the easiest way would probably just be eudoratimes at gmail.com. And I can also put that in the chat. Um, but I would love to answer any other questions or tell you more about what I do and how it works. Great. Thank you for that, Sarah. Um, okay. Well, we have one more question. Um, this is from Jerry. And her question is, she's representing a nonprofit public media organization, and they're always talking about how they might cover the community news to eliminate their news desert. And is there a model they might use to make this possible? And of course, they would want to pay, um, so they would need funding. Where do they start? <laughs> and I don't know if you have an answer for that, but got any ideas for funding sources? With one minute left. <laughs> I mean, I've listened to a lot of people talk about how to start one because as far as the state house file, people talk about how they started it years and years ago. But I think the first thing you have to do is really just gauge interest and make sure the places that you are trying to like cover can really want to receive that news. Because if you can get a couple supporters, like that can go such a long way. I think if you can, just like the state house file does, I think my favorite thing about it is just that we can cover so many areas. So it really depends on what kind of scale you're really trying to cover. But I think you just have to start. You have to make your website. You have to start getting your funding. You have to get reporters that are interested and you have to just start covering things because who knows where your stories might go. You can even pitch to a larger organization to get started. Like there's so many ways to get things started. What was the first funding source for the state house file? I think primarily we first just used like in-house funding for the journalism school as because originally it was just a class like you just took it as a class and we didn't have funding for freelance or anything like that but originally it just kind of got added as a added to the course load so it got some of that funding from just what we have for this journalism school and I think since then we've expanded a lot more okay um and then Sarah do you know what the original funding source was for the Eudora Times um I think well because originally students weren't being paid. So really yeah. there weren't that many costs because we were using, you know, KU facilities. Um, so I think originally um, just KU support and then mm -hmm. it kind of was alumni and other journalism school supporters. Okay. Well, and with that, um, that's all the time we have tonight. Thank you again, Ashlyn, Sarah, and Sid for joining us tonight. That was a really enlightening conversation. You're all doing such incredibly great and important work. I learned a lot from you. And I hope that everyone who joined us tonight learned a lot as well. And um, uh, we look forward to continuing to follow your work. Thank you so much. Thanks and for having me. Oh, thank you pleasure. so much thank you and thanks everyone for joining us tonight